So I think we are more or less complete. So again, a very good morning to everyone who's listening. Um, my name is Christian Lienisch. I will guide you through the seminar this morning. So um, first of all, I would like to thank you to participate, to be interested in uh, yeah, interesting topics about piglet nutrition. We have a kind, prepared a kind of agenda who might be very interesting for you. First of all, myself, I will make a short introduction and guide you uh, and lead you to the context for the key points of piglet nutrition and the challenges in piglet nutrition. And uh, we also want to speak about special ingredients for piglet formulations. You see the list of people who uh, yeah, are willing to, uh, to speak today. First of all, I would like to thank you, my colleague, Ching Ching Yang, who is our animal nutritionist. She will do the second presentation of this morning. First of all, I would like to thank you also about to Professor Dr. Dusel. He is uh, the Professor of Animal Nutritional and Health at the University of Bingen. And he will let us know about the latest news and the challenges in, in piglet nutrition. And me, myself, I will make a short introduction about some topics about, um, about the, the market situation about the situation that we currently face and which are currently challenging us in the in the pig production but before we start a few words about the technical part um, i would like to ask you to be on mute and all the time you can send questions which you which appear you can uh, create them and uh, send them via uh, the what is it, the, the, the chat on the right side. And we will answer your questions after the <clears throat> presentations at the end uh, of the webinar. Um, for the schedule, we will start right now uh, with a, a presentation of me and then uh, from Professor Dr. Dusel will be approximately one hour, I will expect, and then another half an hour from my colleague Ching Ching. And we will have time at a quarter to 12 to answer your questions. Um, you can also download the presentation directly, but also we'll send you the presentation afterwards. Yeah, let me uh, let you know about some facts about our company. Um, I, you can see here some facts about the Limagan Group, which is an international agricultural cooperative group located in France. Maybe more, most of you know uh, the company from the uh, breeding part. So uh, the owners are farmers here in the area of uh, middle of France in the Le Magne, 1,500 farmers, member of the corporation. And um, we are number four in, uh, in seed, in breeding seeds worldwide. And uh, we achieve approximately about 2 billion turnover per year. And uh, what is might be interesting is that at about 40 to 16% will be invested in the research. So if you are breeding uh, seeds, it's very important to, to have a lot of research. And there are a lot of innovations uh, which yeah, are coming up in the next years from the Limagain Group. All over, we are employing 9,000 uh, people uh, of 85 nationalities in 57 countries all over the world. You can see that the focus still is, the main area is Europe, but also in America and in Asia, but also in Africa, uh, yeah, business is, uh, is ongoing and increasing. So if you look to the Limagrain Group, uh, to the Limagrain Lima Cooperative, we see uh, several business units. So starting on the left side, there's a Limagrain Corporation. Um, more interesting, what I also mentioned, already mentioned, is the field seeds, uh, mainly busy with wheat and uh, with maize breeding. Under the brand of LG, it is well known all over the world. We are very strong in vegetable seeds um, and 
and garden products. So this is in this is not a niche market for the company. It's a very very huge market as well. And then you see the ingredients part, which is the business u- business unit of Limagra ingredients. You can see that uh, we are producing flowers for food and feed applications. Um, and on the very right side, you see uh, the bakery products. You can you might know Jacques Boussard, the French people. I think I know uh, this company. They are producing. Um, yeah, bread, sandwich, loves, and all these specialties for the bakery industry. And at least uh, we are t- the business unit of Limagrang Ingredients. And some facts about this business unit. In this business unit, 350 people are employed. Um, it was created in 2002. So as an idea to, to have a to have a, an idea about how to use the products which are produced from the fields. Um, and then the first mill was uh, implemented, was installed. And after the, the, in the last 20 years, almost seven production sites were built up. And we achieved a turnover of 150 million euros. Um, and yeah, most is inside and outside France or in the surrounding in the middle of Europe at seven production sites um, and uh, the production turnover of well, the volumes is at about 330,000 tons of products that we produce and sell to the market. If we look to the feed and food market, so it's divided uh, for, regarding the volumes, it's half half. Um, very strong is the production of feed products in the location of Werbt in the Netherlands but also from some sites in France. We are almost have started to sell products to the feed market. It's not only the byproducts that are, that, uh, are sold, but we're also talking about functional flowers for special applications. Yeah, I will now come to some slides about the challenges in general about pig production in the middle of Europe, but also all over the world. You all know that uh, the African swine fever is now existent in all over Europe. It has started in East Europe, but now we see also in Germany and other areas that the swine fever is has a high impact on the situation of the market. I feel a, a nice picture from a wild boar which trapped to a home in North Rhine Westphalia in Germany. So we see that there are ubiquitia that they are present to distribute the African swine fever. The global challenges which are coming out of this situation, um, I have put on the screen two slides which show very directly what is going what is going on. We see that in two years ago uh, in China, they had also an outbreak of the African swine fever and uh, the import need at the time drastically increased. So that means the Chinese hog slaughter trend was very low at that time. And on the other hand, we see the EU prices on the left side from January 40 to 21. And we see in the times of 2019 that there was a real good price, high price uh, level for, for pig, for meat. And we see then afterwards when the production in China in China increased again that uh, and also the outbreak of the African swine fever in the middle of Europe came up and the import stopped to China that a drastic drop down of the price level has occurred and it has not yet recovered. So this is um, a, a global situation which impacts the situation in the middle of Europe very highly and how do we react in these times of, of low margin, of low prices? And the main question also behind is, do farmers hold on? What is their financial situation? I'm myself, I'm, I'm uh, very well known in the German market, but also in the market in the Netherlands and in France. So what we see is the low prices have a high impact on the income of uh, the farmers. So there is a high pressure on, yeah, very, very, um, good calculation of the production of piglets and pigs in these markets. 
the solution can be to develop sustainable solution for a world without and less antibiotics. Um, this has an impact in general as well. We see an increased animal welfare requirements. So we see also a change in the society about the view on pig production. Um, we also see regulations more or less uh, about housing and feeding appropriate to the species. Nutrition within the framework of species appropriate farms of husbandry, animal welfare is a, is a big issue and a big uh, challenge that we face. We also see the situation of GMO free Europe uh, alternative to GMO soya, European proteins is a challenge. How can we approach and how can we maintain on good proteins without GMO? We also see efficient feeding in times, expensive raw materials. In the last year, the prices for cereals have almost increased about 20 to 25 percent. So the feed is very expensive. And we have also a poor availability of feed additives in worldwide uh, is that seen. We also want to have environmentally friendly feeding, menu reduction, emission reduction. So we are talking about CO2 and nitrogen in general. We also see that uh, the social promotion of healthier nutrition has an impact on the pig production. The need of meat in the market of pig meat and meat in general is lower than two or three years ago. So people are changing their behavior. And at least the question is more about how can we produce more quality instead of quantity? This will be one of the main challenges in the next time. And yeah, a big change is coming up for all market partners. So we think, and I think that this is the main challenge and which has also an impact on piglet nutrition. And what this can mean for piglet nutrition will now be presented by Professor Dr. Dusel. Um, I would like to welcome him in this webinar. Due to some technical issues, unfortunately, we are not able to see him, but we are able to hear him. And I would like to ask Professor Dusel if he can hear me, that we can just right now switch to his presentation. I can hear you very well, thanks. Okay, so I will open up the next slide and uh, it will be at about one hour presentation. Thanks in advance, Professor Dusel, and uh, I will start now and keep listening because we are connected in the same room. Thank you so far. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christian Linisch, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, you mentioned already some uh, points that we have new or we have challenges. And I want to switch to the yeah, to the challenges in yeah, big, big lead uh, nutrition. And therefore, I call this uh, presentation right now recent challenges in big lead nutrition. And I will try to bring it in the next uh, couple of minutes. I will bring it to you with a kind of a practical approach in the formulation of diets for the piglets. Thank you very much for Lima, uh, thank you very much Lima Crane Ingredients to invite me for this uh, talk and I think it's a really important or a really interesting point uh, what can we do what uh, Christian mentioned already some points like uh, yeah GMO free or more more healthy nutrition and therefore it's it's hard to find some uh, solutions, but I think we will have some points what we can focus on, and I will try to show you this one. Uh, I'm sorry you can not see me. I hope you can hear me very well, and I will go through my presentation. And if we see what is a challenge, and then we can ask us what we need uh, from the feed meals, what we need from the nutritionists. And I think uh, very important for the new, or maybe not sometimes not really new, feeding strategies have to be that the quality, high ingredients, and a high quality of raw materials. Sometimes they need to be treated, of course, because we have very young piglets, and therefore we need to. Uh, yeah, to achieve a very high digestibility and therefore is this an important point to think about how much we have to treat our ingredients uh, for feeding this uh, very yeah, young piglets. Also, uh, 
one big point in in the middle of European countries is a low protein diets for piglets. There are different points why we should do it. I will come on this. Of course, uh, there is all always a, a critical phase in the weaning phase and therefore we have to think about reduced oxidative stress for the piglets. Then we need to optimize productivity. Of course, uh, Christian show us the low prices right now and therefore we have to be or we have to go for a really high productive uh, yeah, sows and uh, piglets. And one point what we have always discussed when we talk about uh, piglet feeding we have to minimize the mortality. Alternatives to uh, yeah, antibiotic growth promoters, uh, they were forbidden, I think, 2006 in European countries. Uh, and uh, some countries switch over to a high zinc or copper dose. And we have really think about this if there is necessary to do this. OK, uh, coming to the first point, if we see the production and uh, we have a rapid improvement in the performance of sows in the recent years, just to see uh, different countries and uh, you see, for example, Denmark or Netherlands, they are more than, I would say, 23, 23 uh, 24, uh, sometimes uh, we see farms with more than 26, uh, 36, sorry, 38 piglets uh, weaned per sow and deer. This is a huge number and you see this rapid improvement and therefore we have really challenges to feed our young piglets. Uh, and of course we have some, yeah, some sows with more than 20, more than 22 uh, live born piglets and therefore we really have to think about how we can uh, feed this uh, newborn piglets. Okay, the other point what I mentioned was the yeah, the mortality of our piglets, especially the young piglets. And you can see, for example, uh, Germany. Uh, Germany is quite high with around about 40, uh, 15 uh, pre winning mortality percent. Uh, and you put uh, the rearing mortality on the top, then you can see we come up to 18, and we see in some farms more than 20% of mortality. And this is a huge point what we have really take care on because this is much, is quite too much uh, mortality in our barns. Okay, what is a reason for this high mortality? And you can see there is a quite old uh, yeah, uh, literature, but it's uh, still uh, nice to see that you can see the birth weight is very important. You see higher birth weight. Right now I would switch the birth weight a little bit on the left side, but in this in this part there was, you can see uh, a birth weight around about 1.4, maybe sometimes 1.2, until 1.8, there's very less on a suckling piglet losses. And you can see the survival rate uh, is very high or the optimum will be around about 1.4 till 1.8 kilogram on, uh, yeah, on birth weight. Right now with this high prophylic sows, I would switch it a little bit on the left hand. And I think we need or we have to look for piglets more than 0.9 or maybe 1.0 uh, yeah, kilogram birth weight because this is very important for the piglets. Just a uh, literature from this part, you can see uh, there was measured 5,500 uh, 5, piglets and you can see if you see this lower than 600 gram or between uh, 600 and 800 gram birth weight, you can see we have more than yeah uh, 37 to around 20% on losses. If you see from the day zero till uh, the weaning day, maybe 21, you have more than 50% loss, maybe 30% losses uh, in this uh, in this birth rate range between 600 and 800. And therefore, if we go farther to the yeah, to the slaughter piglets, you can see with this very low birth weight, like 600, 800, maybe less than 1,000 gram, you have huge yeah losses around about 50 or 30 or maybe till 20 percent in the uh, in the range from 800 to 1,000 uh, gram birth weight, and this is much too high if you can yeah 
achieve uh, that we can lower this uh, this mortality that would be a, a big uh, big uh, point in, in the in the in the uh, big production Okay, one very nice uh, work was done uh, in, in Newcastle from Sandra Edwards. Uh, she, uh, she shows some pictures from this so-called EUGR biglets, and you can see there is a kind of dolphin-like forehead, and these biglets uh, have a really low, uh, a very low survival rate. Uh, most of these biglets uh, I really have a high mortality, more than 60-70% right now. Uh, right now we run a trial or more uh, than one trial right now uh, to find these uh, piglets and to select these piglets and try to uh, yeah, re, uh, uh, grow up these piglets with different other yeah, uh, systems uh, what we can use for uh, better uh, nutrition of these piglets. Okay, but if we look for birth weight, of course, we have to go to the sow nutrition, but this is not our point for today. But of course, this would be a, a huge part, nutrition, feed and feed additives, the feed amount, <coughs> the energy protein intake, or if there are some ingredients like uh, different amino acids, vitamins, trace minerals, what we can uh, supplement to our diets, uh, to our sow diets, and that way we can really have a higher birth weight. Uh, very interesting, we did uh, recently some trials on GAA or L-carnitine, and this is also a point that we can uh, focus on and see if there is a point that the birth weight will be higher with these different feed additives. But as I mentioned, this should be uh, as a part, or this is not our focus for today for the presentation for today. Okay, but when the piglets are born, then we have to do the best what we can. And therefore, one of my, uh, yeah, my loveliest slogans is always the milk it makes it. And therefore, uh, it's very important. And a lot of uh, literature is not looking on the milk and the milk composition. And therefore, I will see what important or how important is really our milk uh, composition. You can see the colostrum intake and the birth weight is highly correlated. If we see around about 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.4, 1.6 kilogram birth weight, we have usually a colostrum intake from the bigs around about 400 to 500 grams. And this is very important if we see the slide on the right side, you can see usually our piglets need around about 200, 300 uh, grams colostrum intake to bring down the mortality, mortality rate from approximately 60-70% down to maybe what we can accept 10% or lower than 10%. And you can see it on this, uh, yeah, uh, this nice picture that the colostrum index really influences the piglet performance and the, the piglet survival rate or the mortality rate in this case. It's a nice picture from, from a literature from Bita Kabeldeel from Aarhus University in Denmark. And uh, it's nice to see uh, we need approximately 300 let me say 280 grams of colostrum intake per, uh, per piglet. And uh, what we usually have, and you can see it on this slide, I would estimate around about 20% of our piglets, these blue buttons are always the piglets from the 60 fairing uh, experiments. And you can see, uh, I would say, I would, approximately 20% of our piglets have not more than 250, 280 uh, grams of colostrum intake. And we know that colostrum intake is uh, yeah, uh, influenced by the low mean birth weight. Yeah, you can see it over here. The large litter size, if the litter size is more than 26 piglets per so, uh, we find a lot of yeah low colostrum intake and also the low feed intake per bottom. Yeah, if the sow have a really low feed intake uh, per bottom, then uh, the, usually the colostrum intake from the piglets are less too.
Okay, and uh, it's quite important for the piglets, especially if we come closer to the weaning phase, uh, because you see, it's a nice uh, literature on the, on the left hand side, uh, there's a high relationship between the total amount of immune globulin and uh, the piglet plasma at weaning and the total amount of 24 hours after onset of the farine. That means if we have a high colostrum intake within the first 24 hours, we will see also a high immune globulin in the plasma from the weaning piglets. And this is important because this yeah, leads us to a, to a better healthy, especially in this critical phase from weaning. Also for us, if we see the performance of the piglets, there is on the right hand side, you see if the piglets have more than I would say it's 400 grams, then they have at the weaning time approximately one kilogram higher uh, weaning weight. And this is also very important because all the practical farmers know that if you have piglets with 4.5, maybe uh, less than five kilograms on weaning, uh, this is hard to really do to get this, uh, this uh, small piglets in a kind of good uh, performance. Okay, but how is the uh, colostrum quality? Uh, Christian mentioned um, we have to focus more on quality and not only on quantity. Uh, therefore, it's very important for us to know what is the colostrum quality. And we did uh, a couple of trials in the last uh, months. And you see on the left side, Experiments University in Bingen, uh, that we have a high variation in our colostrum. And we cannot really, uh, yeah, estimate or see uh, if the colostrum is on a good quality or is on a bad quality. And you can see, we try right now with a kind of uh, farm tool uh, with this kind of refractometer and we can see a really nice that there's a high correlation between this uh, measured bricks value uh, from the refractometer and uh, the immune globulin content. And therefore this would be a nice yeah, farm tool for the farmers to see, yeah, very quickly if the colostrum of the sow is on a high quality or is on a low quality. Okay, this is also a, a, a work what we did a, a couple of months ago. And uh, you can see it's interesting uh, if we look for the teeth order and the position of the memory glands. What we find is around about 90% of the piglets have a kind of teat order. They come always back to the same teat. Yeah? And this is interesting uh, because if we see this, uh, that the anterior teats position is always, they have a higher performance compared to these piglets uh, on, the, uh, on the posterior uh, teat position. And if we see, we have this high teat order that 90% of the piglets come back to the same deed every time, uh, then there is a kind of management point. What we have to think about, maybe we can switch or we can uh, move some of the piglets to get the chance for the lower uh, yeah, performant uh, piglets to come up to the anterior teats. That would be uh, maybe a management tool that we can use. Also, it's interesting because if we go back to the colostrum quality, you can see, uh, especially in the teat anterior compared to teat posterior, uh, you can see that the anterior teats have normally a much higher quality of the colostrum. You can see it on the IgGs or IgA, IgD, or also on this point serum albumin or the uh, Boli Ig receptors. Uh, haptoglobin, there's much more quality in the colostrum uh, from the anterior teats compared to the posterior teats. Usually we always talk about milk, milk yield. Uh, uh, when I ask uh, my students uh, how much milk uh, is produced by a sow for a cow, Almost every student know it, but uh, from sows, there's not very much uh, data available about the milk. Yeah, the milk uh, 
yield of the south. And we uh, make some drives in the, in the last uh, years to see what is the milk yield of our usual sows or sow breeds. And you can see there is round about in the yeah, on day 10 till day 20, maybe around about more than uh, 12 or 14 liters. You can see, therefore, we have a really high milk yield in our sows, and therefore, uh, it's a good system to know that the milk is okay. And now we have really adapt our pre-starter feed on this, what the, uh, what the, the piglets need in this phase. But the milk yield is still good enough. Also, if you see this on this slide, uh, the milk composition is also quite good. You see the fat content on our yeah, usual milk after day one till day 21, so it's around about eight, seven percent fat content. Also the proteins around about four, five percent and the lactose is still around about six percent uh, in, uh, in this milk as a content. Very good quality of our sour milk. Okay, just uh, to let you know how our milking machines are working. Uh, this is a hard work and uh, I'm happy to have this uh, really uh, good students right now. They help a lot uh, on this making machine for ourselves. Okay, coming to this critical phase, uh, the, the weaning stress. And we know uh, usually when we are weaning, our piglets have a kind of social stress, separation from the mother, the new groups, uh, from the uh, separation from the old group. We have a kind of environmental stress. Sometimes the piglets will be transported to a new barn. Uh, there's a climate change. Yeah, there's new people there. And also, and this is uh, the point what we as uh, nutritionists have to take care on, we have a kind of dietary stress. And we have to think about, we have a, a rapidly uh, shift from an easily digestible liquid milk feeding to a bland, best solid diet. And therefore we have to think about how we can make this, yeah, this switch very move, smooth for, for, the, for the piglets. Okay, you see it, uh, beside this environmental stress, this social stress, we have this transition on the diet. We have an exposure to dietary antigens, and sometimes, of course, we have an exposure also to pathogen, uh, pathogens. And therefore, we have a quite high weaning stress, and our responsibility is to minimize these negative effects. And we have some of these negative effects like inflammatory effects, oxidative stress. We have usually a alteration of the gut surface. We have usually a reduced immunity. And therefore, this, all these negative effects uh, we have to minimize because otherwise we run in a winning diary a lucky gut or a reduced performance what we know and sometimes also we have to come up to a increased mortality okay that was a point we have to switch from a yeah high digestible sow milk and you can see it on the left hand side so it's uh, yeah high fat content, there's a high lactose content in there as well as a high protein content and we switch to a high starch content and low, I would say low fat and low, uh, uh, low uh, uh, sugar, for example, in this part. And therefore, for us, it's very important to have a kind of enzyme training concept to really to adapt our piglets from this high digestible milk to this yeah, plant uh, based uh, piglet feed or pre starter feed. Uh, one of my, yeah, I like it very well. This, this, this nice literature uh, from Bunix, from the, from I think from from Wageningen, from Netherlands. He did a really good trial, and uh, that's very, very nice to see. And maybe I try to explain this uh, this slide for you. Uh, he tried of the fastening big percent of total, and uh, he uh, yeah separate three different groups. Uh, they have the eater group, yeah. This where the piglets were, 
usually eat on the south already uh, some uh, uh, solid feed, some pre-starters. And then they have the non-feed pigs. They get not uh, access to any uh, yeah, pre-starter or any feed uh, in this, uh, yeah, in this suck suckling phase. And we have also some non-eaters. And you can see, if you see the post weaning interval, so uh, how many piglets are still left for this known eaters, for example, more or around about uh, five to 10 percent of these piglets have no no feed intake in the weaning phase after 70 to 80 hours. And this is really, I think, this other problem, uh, piglets, what we have. You see the eaters, these piglets were uh, have already an feed intake on pre starter intake in the suckling phase. So uh, usually after 20 hours, almost after 10 hours, they have already a lot of maybe 10% without, but the most of them have already uh, any feed intake from these pre starters in the weaning phase. And therefore, it's very important uh, that we can select these non eaters and uh, get it to a kind of eater. Okay, we have uh, such a such a trial. Uh, yeah, bring up uh, the effect of the additional microblazes because this is always a discussion. If we have this high prophylic sows with 20, 21, 22 uh, piglets per sow, and we have usually yeah, what, what can I say, 14, maybe sometimes 16, 16 teats, and this is uh, of course always a question: Have we, yeah, have we? take care or focus on a kind of microblazer or you have to uh, find any better pre-starter feed. And you can see we did a um, trial on around about 220 piglets uh, with microblazer, with a microblazer and a pre-starter. And then there was a usual, yeah, usual feed uh, after weaning. You can see after the piglet, uh, under gross performance, uh, you can see there was no difference between these two different uh, yeah, feeding uh, systems. Out, uh, micro blazer. But uh, we are happy that we also uh, measure the back fat sickness from the south. And this was very impressive because we see, especially uh, this sows without any micro blazer for the biglets, for the suckling biglets, uh, they have approximately two or three uh, yeah, millimeters less on back fat sickness. Therefore, this means uh, that they need much more milk, milk production uh, yeah, to compensate uh, this uh, milk replacer in this trial. Therefore, it's uh, always not just to look on the piglets, if you feed a good pre-starter or a high uh, or a very good milk replacer, it's not just looking on the piglets, you also have to look on the sows and see is a body condition score for the sows maybe very less if we do not feed any pre-starter or feed any good milk replacer on this, uh, on this, uh, on this suckling piglets. Okay, one point what I want to mention is also the yeah the crude protein reduction in the feed in the piglets and why we should do this we know already that uh, if we have uh, yeah a reduction in the crude protein or the nitrogen we have usually less diary in piglets uh, with a reduced protein intake or nitrogen intake also there is very well known that effects of endrotoxis e coli more at high protein high nitrogen intake. And what we know, positive effects of different amino acids, especially tryptophan or valine, on feed intake and immune system. And these are parts what can yeah, support our weaning phase. Okay, I think that's clear and that's it's not really new, but uh, we have to really if I go through the feed meals, especially in Germany or other, other feed meals around the world, you can see not every feed meal have really a current balance in amino acid composition. And I think that's really crucial to get the optimal utilization of the protein in feed and the best conditions for growth for the piglets and therefore the economical benefit.
We know already that an oversupply of the protein must be excreted via liver or via kidney and burdened metabolism and, of course, the environment. And uh, yeah, there are several reviews indicating that are formulating piglet diets based on SID, standardized ileal digestibility, rather than the dotal amino acid content, uh, usually results in a quite better prediction of the performance. We know this already a couple of years. If we uh, go on feed meals and see the optimization of the feeds, sometimes I'm not really sure if they really uh, optimize the feeds on this SID. We did some trials also on this, and you know there is a yeah, so it's a uh, yeah, a challenge, or that it's not so easy to 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 have or to to predict this uh, digestibility measurements. And you can see, usually we do it with a uh, we fit a simple tea cannula at the terminal ileum, and then we can measure this ileal digestibility or the presical digestibility of the amino acids. Okay, uh, why we should take a count on this different amino acids? And I just pick out the tryptophan, and you can see what the tryptophan is uh, uh, is important for. And you can see there is different points. For example, through the serotonin, there is a huge influence on the feed intake. Also, the serotonin, for example, uh, have an influence on the stress prevention or on the behavior of the piglets. Very important is if we have a, a, a ideal protein concept, then usually we have a better growth and therefore a better performance from our piglets. And one interesting point, especially in this critical phase of the weaning phase, is through a good ideal protein, ideal. And therefore, you can hear me still? Okay, I have just a, a point. Okay, uh, and therefore, therefore we, we saw and, and uh, through this uh, yeah, tryptophan in blood plasma, we are see also a better immune response and a better health status. Okay, usually if we go on this ideal protein concept, still some questions coming up. Uh, what is the next limiting amino acids? Usually we go for lysine, mesonine, threonine, tryptophan, and then the question is, what is the next limiting amino acid? And sometimes they ask, is it valine or is it isoleucine or aleucine? And uh, there's, I think there are some nice uh, literatures or uh, works already on the market, you really can see very well that valine is in usual uh, piglet feeds uh, the next limiting amino acid. You can see it on this slide if you have a negative control and supplement isoleucine to the negative control, we have no increase in the performance. Compare the negative control to the negative control plus valine, you can see we have a huge increase in a daily weight gain, for example, or a quite much better feed conversion ratio uh, with this valine supplementation. And this shows us that in usual piglet feeds, uh, valine is the next limiting amino acid what we have to uh, take care of. Okay, we run a trial on this, and you can see it uh, over here, our crude protein level in our uh, four treatments, A, B, C, D, we have a really low and this were weaning piglets, we have a really low uh, crude protein content around about 15.6, 15.7% of crude protein. Uh, in Germany, we are not really clear about what is, is uh, for the ideal protein, what is really uh, the valine content, what we have to supplement. And so if we run this trial with 160 weaned piglets, with this quite low uh, yeah, crude protein content, and we uh, use different valine lysine SID ratios. And you see there was 0.57 to 1 uh, till 0.75 to 1. And we will see or won't see uh, what happens in the performance of these piglets. You can see it on this slide. 
over here you see A, B, C, D already. Uh, so there was a SID value with 4.7, 6.3, 6.9, and 7.5. And you can see in the final body weight, for example, we have a better performance with this, uh, yeah, with this, uh, with this higher point, there was not significant, but if we go on the feed conversion ratio, there was a significant effect on the feed conversion ratio with this higher uh, supplementation of the valine uh, amino acid. Also, you can see this in a, a couple of different uh, trials already that usually we should look for around about 70% the SID value valine to lysine 0.7 in this case the same in feed conversion ratio if we put in a meta-analyze all this uh, data together we see around about uh, the ratio should be around about 70 percent yeah this is what we are looking for right now if we go for the fifth uh, uh, yeah, limiting amino acid and this is uh, still uh, the value okay Switch to another point, and you can see it, uh, the digestibility of the different uh, yeah, products, especially in the weaning phase or also in the pre starter is very important. Just to give you an over overview, you saw it here, or you will see it here in soya meal, but also the same producer could, we can use for the treatment legumes like bee or lupines. And you can see that we have quite higher digestibilities uh, when we uh, treated our uh, soya or treated our legumes uh, uh, enzymatically fermentable or with heat treatments or whatever, because we can reduce usually our antinutritive factors. Uh, the lower uh, the digestibility, the more protein reaches to the lower gut, and this is what we want to really uh, avoid uh, to get these protein sources in the in the in the in the hind gut. Increased risk to pathogen growth is also on one point what we have to uh, take care on this. Okay, we did some research on this, and uh, just for an example, we do not go too deep in this in, in this study, but we also uh, sometimes we measure this. I mentioned already this oxidative stress on this weaning phase, and you can see we measure sometimes in blood plasma the AOPP is advanced oxidative protein products reflection oxidative protein damages, and you can see if we have an treated soybean meal in this kind, uh, soybean meal against treated soy meal and somatically treated uh, soy, soybean meal, we have a lower and significant lower AOPP as well and significant lower heptoglobin uh, value and this heptoglobin usually indicates an inflammatory status. Also what we see if we can really reduce this, yeah, this undenutative factors like antigenes, glycinine or beta conglycinine, uh, you see usually we have less on disrupted cell communities in the lumen. And this is very important because we need a, a healthy gut uh, for the best digestibilities. And therefore, if we can reduce these antinutritive factors, uh, there's a, a huge goal for us uh, to, to, to really to have a better gut health. Okay, this is one point, the amino acids, the nitrogen, uh, but our other point is uh, what we discussed uh, in the last months very, very much is uh, what is about the fiber, especially the soluble fiber. And if we go looking on the fiber, we do not have to go maybe back to the kind of crude fiber, because this is totally different what we are talking about the different fiber sources. And uh, what we know already, especially in sow feeding, uh, there is very important the transit time or the passage time. Also, if we go to this, uh, to this farrowing uh, phase from sows, there is also very important the feces consistency. And the same points, transit passage time and the feces consistency is also very important for the young piglets, especially in this weaning part. You can see uh, sometimes uh, when I talk to older farmers and uh, say, okay, we want to 
yeah, we want to increase the fiber in the diets. They say, okay, no, that's not 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 good because then the, the transit time will be uh, lower and, and, and uh, there's more uh, problems with the piglets. But if you can see there is a work done uh, from on totally diary fiber, uh, there was a low fiber content, 14.4, uh, the uh, mean fiber content, 18.2, and a high fiber content, 23.5 total territory fiber. And you can see if we measure the mean retention time uh, through the solid fast marker and the liquid fast marker, you can see is that uh, usually if we have between a low and a high fiber diet, uh, we have a approximately 10 hour better or faster retention time, transit time. Also, if we go to the liquid fast, on the total tract, we see for 46.6 uh, against 29.7 in the high fiber diets. And you can see there is approximately yeah, 16, 17 hours faster through the gastrointestinal tract. Therefore, sir, we, have, we have to really calculate and you have to see what is important with the fiber. So it's not a kind of uh, con yeah, consti constipation from the, from the from the animals if we have a higher fiber content uh, there is sometimes a better uh, better uh, through through the digester or, or the gastrointestinal tract i cannot uh, show you this slide because i have not a chance to to uh, use this clip but i go maybe to this slide further further and you can see uh, we have some investigations on transit time of different fiber sources in the gastrointestinal tract this was on on a grower finisher pigs, but the same we could uh, talk about uh, the big lead feeding. And uh, just to give you an idea about the hours, what we need over here, there's a minutes after we feed a, a kind of marker. And you see there's uh, just uh, four different, yeah, different raw materials in our diets. We have a wheat bran, a sugar beet bulb, apple pomance and a kind of lignocellulose of this cell in this kind. And therefore, you can see usually our wheat bran, very much on uh, insoluble fiber, have uh, are very fast. But if we have this kind of apple pomance or sugar beet bulb with a higher content on soluble fiber, say so a higher uh, or a, 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 a lower let me say a lower transit time yeah so it's not as fast as with this insoluble fiber and therefore what we have to talk about or think about is maybe if we make it a, a little bit low uh, slower uh, the the transit time then the enzymes in the yeah, small intestine have a better yeah, better time to work and to do their work. And this, therefore, we have to think much more on these different soluble uh, fiber sources. Okay, also, I can show you this slides too. But what we did, uh, we measure also the, uh, yeah, the, the feces consistency and we measure it with this, uh, with this machine. But what, what happens, uh, there were three different treatments, uh, kind of compound diet. We supplement 20% of uh, sugar beet bulb. We have a compound diet with 20% of wheat bran and lignocellulose. And we have a compound diet with 20% of wheat bran. All of them were yeah, optimized on, on, on a same crude fiber content. But what can we see with this penetrometer? Uh, you have a, yeah, uh, 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 much deeper, 30 millimeters, uh, compared to 15.5 millimeters on the deepness, what this, uh, was this uh, Benetrin uh, going down? And therefore, this shows us that the, uh, that the feces is much more fermentable if we feed different fiber sources uh, in this kind, maybe this uh, sugar beet pile. This is maybe much more interesting right now for sows, but I think we have also linked this uh, to our piglet feeding. Okay, coming to the maybe the last part uh, of this uh, presentation, after the 
raw material is very important, of course. The amino acids, the ideal protein, very important. The fiber source. Uh, we have also talked about the feed additives. What we have the chance, which change we have uh, with the feed additives. Maybe we have to go back a little bit uh, to 2006 when the antibiotic growth promoters were uh, forbidden. Then you see uh, after this, the consequence was we had a higher use of therapeutic antibiotic, antibioticas and cookies. Uh, for example, Denmark increased 120 percent antibiotics uh, from 1989 uh, and uh, 2010, mainly against post winning tyrian pigs. Of course, we know that several years required to this new balance. Uh, if we if we have to uh, yeah, adapt on on different systems and so on, but also what we find is usually significant increases in use of medicated feed, mainly by use of zinc oxide or copper. And of of course, you see it right now still in Denmark. Uh, we have quite high zinc oxide levels in. In piglet feeds, uh, they have usually 2,000, 3,000 ppm of zinc oxide in the diets. But uh, there is a huge discussion right now because they will be forbidden uh, in a couple of months. And therefore, right now, maybe uh, you know there's uh, huge uh, webinars and huge uh, summits right now to talk about zero zinc. Yeah? And this is one point what we have uh, really focused on because in Sweden, the use of zinc oxide increased by 630% yeah? from 2000 to 2008. Right now they are down, of course, uh, but you find still in Denmark very, very high levels of zinc oxide. Okay, what uh, what's the consequence? The decrease of antibiotic growth promoters demand increase in hygiene on the farm sometimes. Alternative treated raw materials much more farmers are thinking about okay, what can I improve my in the my digestibility and therefore they think about the treatment of the raw materials. Use feed additives and of course, we, we, we call it innovative feeding strategies. If we go through what we have uh, for possibilities, you can see uh, we have usually first or maybe for me, the most important step is to select the right raw materials. We need excellent quality and sometimes, of course, much more treated uh, raw materials. That's what I think is the first step or the most important step what we can do. Okay, other points, acidifiers, of course, the most of our big lead diets have organic, uh, inorganic acids in salts or plants of acids. I think this is one point uh, we want to miss it uh, because that's one of the biggest point what we uh, think about. Minerals, I think not, not more uh, interesting because we do not like to use this high uh, zinc oxide uh, supplementations up to 2000, 3000 ppm. I think that is not uh, this way what we have to uh, go for. Also very interesting, of course, the probiotics and the prebiotics, the fructo, galacto, oligosaccharides, as well as inulin or lactulose. I think this is one, pay, uh, one uh, product or products uh, which are interesting really to bring it on. Most of the big lead diets have it already in uh, very interesting points. A little uh, still in the research uh, area, I would say nucleotides, peptides, lysosomes, uh, they are not really, yeah, uh, really done a good uh, or too much uh, practic uh, practical drives right now. And therefore, I think that's maybe we will talk about in the next years. Plant extract, of course, we have a lot of different herbs, essential oils, aromatic plants. And uh, the other point, enzymes, and I think this is very important because most of our diets in the uh, Western European countries have already a kind of non starch polysaccharide right in as well as uh, a phytase. Uh, proteas, uh, we did also some drives on proteas. There is not really, yeah, Practical right now, I would say we, we have a lot of drives and see a lot of drives, and there was not a clear effect of these proteases right now in the big diets. 
Okay, uh, buffer capacity, especially when we are talking about the raw materials, what we are using, or we're talking about the, uh, the, the organic acids. You can see, of course, we can switch between monocats and phosphor or t cats and phosphate, and uh, monocats and phosphate will be much better compared to t cats and phosphate in the buffer capacity for the big leads. And we have to go down because in our storage from a big lead, we have a pH value around about 2.5, 3.5. And therefore, we do not like to buffer it up with a, a huge, uh, huge, huge part of calcium uh, carbonates or magnesium oxide. Also interesting is if we, if we go to the acids, uh, for example, formic acid have a really negative uh, HCL uh, content and several for buffer capacity it is very well uh, known that the formic acid is working very well. If you see the mode of action of chronic acid, this is not new. This is, uh, I think that's uh, already clear that we have a reduction of the pH levels, improvement of palability and hygiene. We have a reduction in the gastric pH level I mentioned so is around about three pH and therefore enhancement of the pepsin activity. If there's working very well with the pepsin and the nitrogen, of course we have uh, an increased nutrient digestibility in the small intestine, less pathogen microbials like E. coli, for example, in the hindgut. Also effects on the microflora. This is very interesting, especially when we are feeding for a soluble or insoluble fiber condense. Then we have to really focus on the on the microflora. And if everything is working well, of course we have less diary and less nitrogen and phosphor excretion. And this is very important, especially in the Western countries, uh, Western European countries right now. Okay, probiotics. I don't uh, want to go through all these uh, yeah, modes of actions, but there's sometimes there's clear that we have a competition for, for nutrients between probiotics and under acid bacteria. We have some increasing synthesis of lactic acid, very important sometimes, and the reduction of the intestinal pH level, especially in the stomach and the small intestine, duodenum, for example. Also reduced. Uh, yeah, production of toxic amines, decreases of ammonium levels in the gastrointestinal tract, and very important also the benef uh, beneficial effects on the intestinal immune system. And uh, this is uh, one point after AGPs were forbidden. Uh, I think probiotics uh, are one of the first choice what we use right now in the diets for piglets, especially for intervening phase. Of course, we have all these uh, yeah, rankings in of in vitro antimicrobial capacity of essential oils, herbs, and so on. Uh, you, can, you can see it on this, uh, but uh, there's sometimes not really clear effects uh, through these uh, products. Sometimes uh, working very well, and sometimes we have tried. There is no effect on this uh, of on this uh, yeah herbs or essential oils. Okay. Coming to the take home messages, uh, for me, my VIP, my very important point is, I think very important is the birth rate and the colostrum quantity and quality. Of course, this is not uh, this what we talk today about, because uh, if we want to improve the birth weight and improve the colostrum quality, we have to feed the sow, yeah, and therefore this would be a other topic uh, to discuss as a sow feeding. But this is one of the very important points uh, for a good start uh, for the he healthy piglet starts. Gastrointestinal tract of piglets are not completely developed at weaning. We need avoid dietary stress, and I'll show you some parts of how we maybe avoid this through treated raw materials. We have to look on the ideal protein content like valine, tryptophan. Uh, and of course, very interesting, uh, and I think Jun Jun will uh, focus on this later on, on in, in this meeting, in this webinar. Uh, very important is also the soluble fiber part. Besides, and this was a point, besides good raw materials, quality may be treated, acidifiers, probiotics, prebiotics, enzymes 
are the most promising feed additives uh, for a healthy big start. Okay, thank you very much and thank you also always to my team because they do the most of the work uh, I'm talking about, but these guys are in the barn and in the feed me and, and work on this. That was thanks also my team and if there are any questions, I would be happy to, uh, to, to, to answer on this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, okay, thank you very much, no. Professor Dusel. I have an echo in my computer so yeah in the middle of this group you can see professor Dusel. um so it's good to have a small picture of you so thank you very very much for this uh interesting presentation it's a kind of review to the basics of uh yeah piglet and sound nutrition but also um some very interesting information about recent trials and uh research that has been done in your university and also internationally so it gives us a very good overview of what the challenges are i think you've yeah you covered also well uh, the points of reducing environmental uh, uh, additives like zinc and kappa which which are more or less reduced uh, and prohibited in the future so thank you very much um I'm looking forward to the questions of the group uh, of the attendancy. So I, my paper is full of questions. Unfortunately, we cannot discuss every question at the end of this um, meeting of this webinar, uh, but I will uh, trigger you all to raise questions afterwards to people of our, of our company or to your contacts in the group. Um, I will now move to the presentation of my colleague, Ching Ching Yang, who is our nutritionist. We also did some researches uh, in the soluble fiber aspects, how to use soluble fibers or what cereals can bring in the nutritional uh, aspect for a better nutrition of mainly of piglets, but also of uh, other species. So I would like to uh, give the, my word to Ching Ching. Uh, you're already uh, there, I see. Yeah. So yeah, if you want, you can start now. Yes, thank you, Christian. And thank you again, Professor Dusso, for this informative lecture. I will expand more on the high quality cereal ingredients for piglets. Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's nice to see that there are some people I know who also part, uh, who are also participating in this webinar. I'm Chen Chen, technical support by Lima Grain Ingredients. Um, I help uh, colleagues and and the clients to solve problems and challenges. So uh, if you got any questions during this presentation or any time after this presentation, don't hesitate, don't hesitate to let me know. Okay, let's get started. Let me show my presentation. Oh, there are still, I think my presentation is uh, here. No, I'm too far Yeah, Yeah. Uh, as you know, the theme of this presentation is Presco, our pressure cooked ingredients, improve the technical performance of uh, piglets. Uh, there are five parts of this presentation. First, I will talk about yeah, what's Presco, uh, then effect of Presco on the internal, internal structure of grains, followed by um, the effect on digestibility on starch, especially starch and the fiber. Then I will introduce the uh, uh, Presco carrier briefly in the end uh, uh, summary. <coughs> uh, let's uh, get started. Yeah. Uh, Professor Dusso mentioned uh, um, about the hygiene on the farm. We also need to pay attention to the raw material hygiene. Uh, so that's the reason we do double cleaning process before the Presco uh, process. When we receive the raw materials, we run the bulk grain over different sieves and aspiration devices to get rid of the, um, the dust, broken kernels, and other uh, components. So the only intact uh, cereal grain kernels will be stored in a storage silo. And on the day of the production, we will run this, uh, uh, these raw materials again um, via these sieves and the uh, devices to clean it again. Uh, because of this uh, double cleaning process, we can reduce microtoxin concentration. 
uh, because yeah, the mode is most likely to be in these locations. And because of this double cleaning process, our total yield, um, we, we lose about 6% of this total yield compared to uh, 2 to 3% by normal cleaning process. However, we got cleaner products, which means less microtoxins, less hazards, and which can be translated into better animal performances. As we know, animal, young animals uh, are really sensitive to microtoxins. The next slide. Yeah, uh, let's see what's PRESCO. PRESCO stands for pressure cooking, a unique uh, puffing process uh, based on calculated combination of uh, pressure, steam, and time. On the left side, you can see an illustration of a, a Presco process. Uh, the whole process goes like this. First, the clean grain go to the puffer. The puffer has a really high pressure, normally 200 to uh, 250 to 300, uh, um, sorry, it's 20 to 25 uh, bars and overheated steam. The temperature of the steam is about 250 to 300 Celsius degree. The grain stay there for a few seconds. Then the pressure is reduced abruptly. The grain are shot to the tunnel, then pop. Why? Because the water in the uh, starch granules evaporates. As a result, the granules swell instantly. We know one more water in liquid form occupies much less space than steam. When the steam evaporates, it digs holes in the starch granules. Thus, the crystalline structure is completely broken down, just like the popcorn we eat. This is the process of starch gelatinization. Then the puffed grains will be cooled instantly. Because of this instant cooling in process, in Presco manufacturing process, no retrogradation takes place. We know starch retrogradation makes it indigestible. Presco gelatinized cereals are further processed into final products. With the manipulation of pressure, steam, and time, we can guarantee optimal starch gelatinization, batch to batch consistency, and of course, the shelf life in, is improved as well as reduced uh, hazards. Then the next slide. Yeah, this slide shows um, uh, our Presco processed uh, baby corn in different forms. Then let's see, um, let's have a closer look and electron microscope to see the internal structure of a native whole grain kernel and presco puffed kernel. On the left side, that's the um, internal structure of a native wheat on the top and native barley on the bottom. As we can see here, the internal structure is, is intact. The, we can see clearly the starch granules embedded, uh, surrounded by other uh, fibers, proteins, and other components. And after Presco, no intact starch granules can be seen anymore. And we can see this porous structure, internal structure, which makes starch and fiber more available to the uh, digestive enzymes. Uh, besides this uh, uh, whole grain kernel kernels, we also uh, did the electron microscope uh, scanning for the milled version, the, nat the uh, native wheat uh, meal, meal and native wheat corn meal. As we can see here really clearly, especially for corn, you can see many intact starch granules. Now we move to the right side after Presco, we don't see uh, intact starch granules anymore and the structure is more porous. Then next, uh, I will talk about the effect, uh, the, uh, the effect on digestibility. Uh, firstly, the viscosity. In 2008, we did uh, 
a trial to see the viscosity of Presco maize uh, compared to untreated micronized steam flakes and a expanded uh, uh, materials. As we can see here, Presco has the highest viscosity, which means longer retention time in the stomach. Um, we know protease uh, is highly active in the stomach, so more time for the enzyme to do their work, just like Dr. Uh, Professor Dusso said. That means, yeah, for the highly pro uh, higher protein digestibility. The next slide. In order to validate the test we did, uh, yeah, more than 10 years ago, uh, in 2020, we did another uh, study with the salt toast uh, fit research. And the test mimics the environment in the stomach and the proximal part of the small intestine. And the press as you can see the graph on the uh, left side, the pink line is uh, uh, Presco baby barley. The second line, the red line, is uh, expanded barley uh, from the market. The viscosity um, in the stomach of a baby barley is uh, uh, much higher than the expanded barley. However, when it gets to the small intestine, when the pH, uh, uh, pH increases, the um, viscosity of uh, baby barley drops significantly. That means a higher retention time in the stomach, but lower lower viscosity in the small intestine. You know, high uh, longer retention time in the stomach, better protein digestion. Uh, however, we want to avoid um, viscosity in the small intestine to avoid diarrhea, of course. And that's the same story for um, high energy. That's yeah, fifty percent of barley and fifty percent of corn, compared to the uh, expanded mixture on the market. Then the next uh, slide. So, yeah, next, uh, yeah, we did um, another trial in two thousand eight uh, to compare Presco processed grains with untreated uh, grains to see the ileo in vitro digestibility of uh, organic matter and starch. Uh, the pic picture on the uh, top is for presco gelatinized maize, the bottom is for wheat. Mm, the, the yellow bar represents ileo digestibility of uh, organic matter and the orange bar represents ileo digestibility of starch as we can see here compared to untreated maize uh, presco gelatinized maize um, has a higher ha has higher ileo digestibility of both organic matter and starch that means yeah higher feed uh, conversion and bad animal uh, growth in the end and that's the same uh, story for wheat on the bottom as well. Then, and besides the comparison with the untreated uh, grains, we also uh, did a trial uh, to see the different uh, uh, the differences between different uh, technologies that gelatinized uh, gelatinizes starch. Um, as we can see here, the, the Presco gelatinized wheat, uh, wheat has uh, the highest uh, ileo digestibility of organic matter and starch compared to untreated, uh, macronized, uh, steam flakes, and expanded wheat. Then, because we did these trials, like more than 10 years ago. So in order to um, validate this uh, test uh, in 2020, we cooperated uh, with uh, uh, Claremont uh, Avonia University to use uh, um, Team 1 system. That's the TNO uh, gastrointestinal model to simulate uh, the proximal part of the digestive tract of wind piglets. The simulation uh, lasted for six hours, and we want to see the um, the starch 
uh, digestibility of uh, different uh, uh, different uh, process, different uh, barley processed in different uh, technology. Uh, the B1 is the Presco processed barley. Then uh, the BAO2 is expanded, uh, extruded, then expanded. Uh, this is the team one system uh, it's quite uh, complex uh, it's a um, controlled uh, simulator and it is said it is one of the most efficient and complete uh, dy uh, dynamic system um, it has uh, uh, controlled and simulated fun functions adapted to our model, the wind piglets. For example, uh, testing, testing the tone, uh, main digestive uh, secretions, and pH, all of it should be adapted to the wind piglets. And this model has uh, four compartments. First of all, the stomach, then duodenum, jejunum, ileo. And on the uh, left side and right side, on the left side and the right side, you can see the uh, dialysis system. Uh, that's the system collects uh, small components coming from uh, hydrolysis of uh, micronutrients. These are the nutrients in the normal situation will be absorbed by the piglet. Then on the bottom in the uh, red box, that's the um, ileal effluence, uh, which collects uh, in digested and non-digestible components, in, in vivo situation, these components go further to large intestine. And this is the general introduction. Yeah, uh, because of uh, the limited time, um, I wouldn't go uh, further. If you want to know more about it, yeah, please let me know. Then we will go directly to the uh, results. As we can see on the, uh, on the graph, Presco processed barley has the highest starch digestibility compared to expanded, extruded and expanded uh, uh, barley, which means that yeah, Presco gelatinized cereals are more available for the animals. Then let's see what's uh, happening. Mm, uh, on the fib fiber components. Uh, Dr. Dusso mentioned about, uh, yeah, it's important to look at the, the different uh, uh, different parts of the fiber components. For example, the, the soluble and insoluble uh, uh, fibers. So this is uh, uh, this uh, a graph illustrates uh, um, what's happening to the fiber components. In the normal uh, unprocessed uh, uh, cereal grain, these uh, fiber components are um, well structured. Uh, they have their own, own structure. After pre Presco, uh, this uh, uh, compact structure of different fiber components is completely uh, destroyed. Uh, the long chain polymers are cut into short chains. That means yeah, uh, the, the fibers are more available to the enzymes and the bacteria. And this uh, hypothesis is confirmed by our lab study in Rayon. As we can see here, there are two graphs uh, for uh, the soluble dietary fiber. The left one is uh, um, the comparison of uh, raw maize with the Presco baby uh, maize, baby corn. As we can see here, the, uh, uh, the, per the percentage of um, soluble fiber is increased uh, 250%. That's uh, uh, a lot. And on the right side, that's uh, the comparison of raw barley with the Presco baby barley. The soluble fiber is increased more than 40%. So which means Presco makes dietary fiber more fermentable. Oh, I think I'm going too far. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, 
Of course, besides this in, vi uh, in vivo test, uh, we also did an in, vi in vivo test uh, in 2016. After all, we want to see the improvement of uh, piglet performances in real life, in real situation. So we did this, uh, this test. Um, uh, there were almost 200 uh, piglets involved. Um, uh, they had the whole study was divided into two phases, uh, the pre-start phase from day one to day 15 and the start phase from uh, day 15 to uh, day 29. And the, both of the diets were uh, included 50% uh, um, of gelatinized cereal, uh, cereal maize either from a Presco process or from a uh, competitor um, maize. Um, the piglets were divided uh, uh, randomly, were grouped randomly, and the diets were given as uh, pellets and the piglets uh, uh, were rec uh, receiving this uh, feed at Lipton. Uh, then the second, uh, mm, this is a little bit, uh, I don't know how, yeah, I think I have issues with the, moving the slides. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No. We try, Ching Ching, we try to help you. <laughs> to hurry up? No, we okay. try to help. We tried. Can you, can you hear me, Ching Ching? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, we try to help you. Is that the right one now or should we move yeah, the yeah, slide? Yeah, the, this is the right one. This is the right one. Yes. Yes, this is one. This is uh, the, these are the results. Um, the graph on the left side is the body weight on day one, uh, day fifteen. Then the end of this trial, as we can see, Presco group had a slightly lower initial body weight on day fifteen. It was still slightly lower than the competitor group. However, on day twenty nine, that's five days after winning, the body weight of Pig, piglets fed, uh, fed on Presco baby corn exceeded uh, of that of the competitor corn group. As for the uh, average daily feed intake showed by the right graph, baby corn group had always higher feed intake than the competitor group. The total average daily feed intake and the feed intake on the starter phase was significantly higher than that of the other gelatinized corn on the market. So to conclude, Presco baby corn is highly palatable to these piglets, thus they eat more, much more, and therefore they gain uh, more body weight after weaning, which is log logic. Uh, then I will introduce uh, uh, Presco carriers briefly. Uh, Dr. Dusan already mentioned that uh, uh, is organic acid is one of the alternatives to uh, um, to uh, one we don't have uh, yeah antibiotics for the pigs. We know yeah the immature pigs uh, produce less much uh, much less gastric acid, uh, especially for wind piglets. Wind piglets, their gastric pH normally range from 2.6 to 4.2. And acid can help uh, with their digestion and as well as suppress bacterial yeast growth. Even they have antimicrobial effects. However, organic acids, uh, needs acidic environment to exert their antimicrobial effects. A study showed that this antimicrobial effect is dependent on the inclusion, inclusion rates of this organic uh, uh, acid, as well as the buffering capacity of the diet. Let's see the uh, acid binding and buffering capacity of common used feed material. As we can see here, the, 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 the green bar is for limestone. Limestone has really high both buffering and binding capacity. 
So we uh, we we don't want to put too much a uh, uh, limestone or limestone like uh, mineral minerals in the diet as carrier, because yeah, the piglets they mm, they they. They re, they already have a quite high stomach as uh, stomach pH, so we want to lower the pH. And uh, as we can see in the uh, slide, the first one is wheat, then maize, then barley. These are the cereal uh, ingredients. They have naturally low uh, uh, B, uh, acid binding and binding capacity and uh, buffering capacity compared to other common um, feed raw materials. For example, yeah, the fish meal, um, uh, all amino acids, wheat powder, etc. So cereal, uh, cereal carriers are really good alternative uh, for these uh, um, uh, mineral-like carriers. Then to summarize, um, Presco process gelatinized starch to supply easy digestible energy for piglets. And it can also make fiber more available. And it is highly palatable to piglets to increase their feed intake. In the end, yeah, we want to get better uh, technical performances after a smooth weaning transition. And this is the end of my presentation. I'd like to hear, yeah, uh, questions from you guys. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ching Ching, for this uh, nice presentation. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, we received a question about the p-values of the studies that we did, uh, Ching Ching. Maybe you have uh, an answer on that. If not, we can provide them after the webinar. Oh, I don't have it in my mind. I will, uh, I will check. And it's noted, the question is noted. Okay. P value, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you so far. I would, yeah, we have now uh, 11.34, so we have uh, almost uh, time left to discuss the topics, to discuss uh, the presentations. I would like to ask you to uh, raise some questions in the chat in the chat room, um, and I will di directly ask them to the presenters. So my question is, Professor Dusel, are you hearing us? And can you quickly say something that we know that you are still online with <laughs> I'm us? I'm still online and I can <laughs> okay. hear you very well. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So it's due to the technical issue that you cannot be, uh, that we use another platform to hear <laughs> and uh, to hear you. So. Um, I have received uh, one question uh, to Professor Dusel. Let me see if I can. Um, so there was one question uh, in the formulation of piglet milk replacers. What improvements should be made in order to improve to improve the efficiency of these milks? And 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 uh, what I also saw is that you were mentioning. A, something about uh, the transition uh, period from liquid to solid feed. Uh, this is one question that we received. That's a good question. We uh, try to find out, and this was one reason why we uh, have these trials with milking our sows, and we want to really know what is in this milk from the sow. And therefore, we did some screening right now on the uh, amino acid composition of the sow milk. And therefore, I think that would be a nice part on this milk replacers if we really can uh, yeah, simulate uh, the amino acid content of the, of the sow milk because there are very less uh, data available on this uh, and therefore there's a huge difference what we see in the, in the composition of the amino acids and therefore this would one point what uh, we are interested in uh, and therefore we can simulate it and, 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 and switch it over to a milk replacer what we find in the uh, original milk, in the original sow milk. Okay, thank you. Personally, also one question. Um, it's about the transition time that when using different sources of uh, 
of uh, soluble or insoluble fibers feeds. Um, wh what do you think is 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 more efficient for the digestion of the nutrients? Is it the longer passage rate or is it a smaller passage rate? And also regarding the diarrhea, is it better that we have a longer transition period? Um, or a shorter transition period and and what we what i know from my from my experience is that we also want to have a good fermentation especially for the sows they can gain when i'm right uh, about 10 percent of the energy out of of the fermentation uh, in uh, of 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 the feed so so what what can be your answer to that question yeah, you are totally right. I agree on this. If we go on the sow feeding and uh, see the transition phase uh, from the sow, so it's very important that we have a lot of fermentable fiber, fiber sources in because we do not want to have a kind of comp uh, comp uh, com uh, Oh, I missed the word. Sorry. Uh, constitution. And therefore, uh, we need a kind of uh, yeah, a very fermentable fiber in this part. Yeah, uh, if you go to the piglet feeding, I think that's very important. Uh, we see the small intestine and the hind gut, the hind intestine, because in the small intestine, I think we need more time, and there is a, a good system that we have a longer transit transit time in this because we need this time for the enzymes. Yeah, and uh, in the hind gut, if we have a good fiber source in our diets and we have a good uh, hindcut fermentation, I think that would be the two important points from this transit time. A, lo a little bit longer transit time in the first part for a higher enzymatical uh, uh, digestibility and in the hindcut we need a more fermentable uh, possibilities and therefore there is, there is not uh, really important. I would really separate these two parts from the transit time and really separate it in a hindcut and in a small intestine uh, digestibility or transit time. Yeah, thank you for, for the answer to this question. There's a, one question to Ching Ching. Um, Ching Ching, you talked about the absence of retrogradation with the Presco process compared to other processes. Can you clarify what retrogradation is? Oh, uh, retrogradation is uh, yeah the gelatinized uh, uh, starch. Uh, when you cool it down again, um, the entangled uh, uh, amy amylose and amylopeptin, they form again to the uh, original form. So that means, yeah, you go back uh, to the, uh, uh, the, the, the raw uh, condition again, uh, which makes it uh, yeah, less uh, uh, digestible. It's like you cook it, then it go back again after cooling, just like the uncooked uh, starch. Mm. So, so retrogradation is about uh, is yeah it's 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 an effect which appears and it's not good for the digestibility at least. Uh, when I no, because your purpose is to entangle uh, the uh, the chain of uh, uh, amylose and amylopectin. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there was another question to Professor Dusel uh, in. In the solution for reducing antibiotics and zinc oxide, you mentioned prebiotics such as oligosaccharides, enoline, and lactulose. Uh, is there other positive fermentable fiber naturally found in the animal feeding, such as soluble hemocellulose, beta glucans, Arab <laughs> arabinoxylans, or resistant starch? Is there something researched on that, or is there something known about it, about the yeah, I, I think uh, especially the resistant starch is very interesting because that works like a probiotic. And uh, if you have really good uh, starch, comments resistant starch, not really uh, digestible in in a, in a small intestine, then there is coming up to the uh, to the hindgut, and uh, therefore we find, or we did also some research on this, and we find with a higher content on resistant starch, of course you get a higher production of 
butyric acid in the hindgut. And butyric acid is very well known that there is very positive in the hindgut, also on, uh, on, on, on different health uh, status of the hindgut. And therefore, I think this uh, probiotics are interesting uh, products, especially resistant starch. I think it's very, very, very good uh, source for a higher butyric acid uh, production in the hindgut, and this works for uh, uh, for the gut health in the piglets. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? So please type in the chat room. Um, so I have also noticed some questions uh, in between there. We receive more questions. <laughs> you were talking about um, valine as a limiting amino, uh, amino acid. Um, do you think looking to the current situation in the market of availability of, uh, of, of amino acids uh, in general, is there is, will that be uh, an effect which will remain a little bit or will that uh, shortly recover that all these nutrients feed additives will become available? Perhaps you are, you are not well known in this uh, because feed millers are more uh, yeah, uh, involved in this uh, problems currently. But um, I think the nutrients or the feed additives uh, which are currently to some trouble and challenges in the feed formulations. But in general, do you have a view on the situation in the market, or do you hear something yeah. in the, in practice from from this point of view? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm I, I was working on a feed mill for several years, and therefore I was optimizing uh, diets, and I know exactly what what is going on there, and I know of of course uh, the market right now uh, and the short in in lysine and other amino acids, and uh, what we can see in the market or what. I realized in the market that some of the yeah, feed mills, of course, uh, you can optimize it, uh, that the crude protein content is increasing in diets for piglets, yeah, because uh, then you can uh, save some of the amino acids or, or the, the content or the, yeah, so the, the values of the, uh, the, of the amino acids. But I think that's, if, if we are, yeah, through this, this uh, critical time and I think uh, the amino acids will still be able on the market. I think that is not the right way to uh, to go back and uh, increase the crude protein content and the nitrogen content in the in the diets. Uh, I think if we really want to go down on the nitrogen, the crude protein, we have to handle with this uh, with this amino acids. And I think that's not the, the end. I think uh, we will talk in the next couple of months and years, we will really talk about isoleucine and leucine. Yeah? And uh, therefore, uh, I, I see no really good chances. Of, of course, uh, what we are talking about, a higher digestibility of uh, crude protein, if we could achieve this, that would be a uh, one benefit point, but I think there is no way around the, uh, the amino acid, uh, the supplementation of amino acid in our piglet diets, if we want to go down in crude protein. Okay, thank you. There is one question appeared. Um, what kind of feed composition would you recommend for piglets uh, to begin to eat mixed feed? So in the beginning of the transition period. The question is, is to me or yeah? Yeah, I think it's for you. Maybe yeah. Yeah, who, who wants to uh, answer the question, but I think yeah. it's, it's mostly... Maybe, maybe I can start. Uh, yeah. uh, unfortunately, I cannot hear the, 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 the presentation from uh, Jin Jin, but uh, I saw the slides and therefore I think very interesting is really the point if we have more fiber sources, especially in this critical uh, time point, yeah, from weaning. Uh, of course, we need still high uh, digestible uh, stuff uh, or high digestible raw materials uh, because we need uh, a really, uh, yeah, high improvement or uh, performance from the from the weaning part. But I think we can really save the hindgut or uh, the health of the hindgut if we have a good uh, fiber source in. In, in, in our diets. I think also the question was about the composition of the feed and about the nutrients using. We saw that coming from a sow, uh, from the sow milk, which is high in fat, changing to 
uh, solid feed, which is high, more high, or higher in starch and, and cereals. So in this transition period, of course, there is a, there is a lack of uh, of digestibility. So so uh, the components also play a big role. And looking to this is my answer, uh, talking about. Um, uh, yeah, cereals which are almost processed. It's uh, I know from the practice that it's rather different how feed millers do their composition. The highest uh, level of uh, high quality ingredients and also of milk ingredients um, will be used, of course, in the in, in the in the wiener diet uh, and also in the pre-starter diet. So up to let's say thirty to forty percent of uh, pre gelatinized. Uh, uh, cereals, but also other components uh, like milk components and and soya concentrates, and you know, and then yeah, of course there is no no uh, uh, general uh, general composition recommended. I guess uh, this is also something which can answer your question. But maybe Ching Ching, you have also yeah. an answer to this question. Yeah, it depends on you want to uh, maximize the performance of the piglets or you want to avoid the diarrhea or you have high pressure uh, uh, infection pressure in your farm if it's in a normal situation like you want to increase the performance of course we provide uh, 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 high quality raw material that's the first step and the most important step then you add uh, on top like uh, the additives mentioned by professor Dusso um acids enzymes uh of course when you look at uh, for the for the fiber components when you look at the fiber components you shouldn't just look at the crude fiber you have to look at the fiber in total dietary fiber then you have to zoom in to see uh, uh how many um uh, how uh, how many percentage uh, is inert fiber how many percentage is uh, soluble fiber you have to have the good combination especially in the uh, transit period we uh, if you got problems of course you have a higher inert fiber in the diet better to uh, be against the bacteria in the hindgut but if they are healthy, um, you can increase the soluble fiber a little bit. Then you have better fermentation, better um, better health for the for the piglets, especially in the trans transit period. And for the uh, protein components, of course, we want to give them highly digestible proteins. Um, when you only look at the crude protein, you don't know if the crude crude protein is absorbed by the piglet or it, it goes to the hangout for the bacteria. Yeah, that's what I would add. Okay, thank you, Ching Ching. Um, so I'm looking to the question box. I did not receive any further questions. So that can mean that all questions uh, are clarified or that uh, they will come after our meeting or our webinar. So this is what I would like to say to you. Please feel free to contact us uh, and to, to continue the discussion. Um, it's an ongoing process in general, looking for good feed formulations for young animals. And we saw at the presentation of Professor Dusel that, uh, yeah, the basics are always good to, to review and also have a look into the new requirements from this from the yeah, environmental point of view from animal welfare point of view this is uh, i think the biggest challenge for the future but also looking to international market situation increasing prices the the need of better food in the in the world um, and yeah therefore it will be an ongoing process and is challenging us as a nutritionist and also as sign as scientists. Um, I would like to thank you all for participating in this webinar. Um, again, I, you, can, uh, res you can download the presentation. I will uh, mention that, but also we will send to you the pre presentation. Uh, we have your contact data uh, available so we can uh, directly send it to you after this meeting or during the day. I'm looking to my colleague. So thanks so much to everyone. Thanks to Professor Dusel for having time this morning and preparing this uh, really uh, good presentation. And thanks to Ching Ching and all, to all participants. So I will close the webinar now and wish you a good day and stay healthy, whatever you do and wherever you. you are. Thank you.
拜拜。